Welcome to the River Online Sermon. Thank you for joining me today. I hope that you're having a wonderful summer. Let me pray for our time together. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this opportunity to dig into your word. We pray that you would help us to be attentive to what you want us to receive from your word today. Help me to be open to your directing as I teach. And may you receive all the honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So I was online recently looking up who was the is the most educated person in the world. The results were a little bit scattered. I came across several different names, including um, Michael Nicholson, R.K. Rye, and Hardiel Singh Sainby, who each qualif apparently qualify for that title. Each of them have about 30 to 35 different degrees in a variety of different disciplines. But one other name that kept coming up was V. N. Parthaban, a 60-year-old professor from India who, according to reports, has 145 degrees and counting. It's quite impressive. I don't know exactly what to make of all of it. I don't know why there were so many different varying reports about who is the most educated person in the world. But ultimately, in our passage for today, we're going to take a look at a couple of guys who combined to have exactly zero degrees. And that, along with some other things, actually helps them stand out in a room full of people known for their education. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 4. So we're continuing on our sermon series through the life of Peter with the ending of a story that we started three weeks ago. Uh, the story began with the, the healing of a lame beggar outside the temple followed by a, a sermon from Peter. I preached on the, the healing itself three weeks ago and then Nathan preached on Peter's sermon and then last week, our intern, Josh, took a break from the story as he looked at John chapter 7 for his first sermon ever, which, by the way, I think he did a great job. But today we return to the story of the lame beggar to see how it all wraps up. Before we get to the passage itself, let me just make sure that we understand the context. So as I mentioned, the lame beggar was healed. Then Peter gave a gospel message. After that, two things happened. First of all, a, um, a bunch of people responded to the gospel, and then also Peter and John got into trouble. So the way the numbers are reported in verse 4, it, it's a little bit hard to understand, but the, the number that is used is 5,000. It's not certain if that is referring to the number of people who responded to Peter's sermon at that moment, or if it's referring to uh, the updated number of believers once you add in the numbers from that uh, response to Peter's sermon. It's also not certain whether this is tracking all those who believed in Christ or if it's tracking simply the men. We don't really know. It's, it's uncertain in the way it's worded. Regardless, it shows that there were many who responded to Peter's sermon in this moment, but also that the church as a whole was growing. However, while the response of the people was great, it also turns out that some Jewish religious authorities also showed up, and it says that they were greatly annoyed. And so they arrested Peter and John and put them in jail for teaching about Jesus and the resurrection. The next day, Peter and John were brought before the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews, which included the high priest, some members of his family, and um, some other like elite or wealthy uh, Jewish leaders, as well as religious scholars. They apparently sat in like an elevated semicircle uh, in their court, and um, Peter and John would have been brought in and placed um, in that um, little inner circle kind of thing to be addressed. Um, and that's where we pick things up in Acts chapter 4, with verse 7, on the day after they were arrested. It says, And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation or no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So what's their issue? What, why did the Sanhedrin bring these guys in for questioning? What, what did they do that, that, um, that people were so annoyed by? Well, basically, the ruling council had 
probably three issues with them. First of all, they were teaching the people without really having authority. Uh, they were not rabbis, not religious leaders. They were just ordinary guys who didn't really have the authority to teach. Second, they were teaching about the resurrection. Now, much of the Sanhedrin uh, was made up of, of Sadducees, which was a, a Jewish sect like the Pharisees, um, but they specifically did not believe in the resurrection. And they made up a lot of the Sanhedrin, so this teaching would have annoyed them, and, and we can see that here. But third, and most important, and the reason they probably were really um, bothered by these guys, was that they were declaring Jesus as the Messiah, and since the religious leaders were the one the ones who conspired to kill Jesus, the fact that Peter and John were teaching that he was the Messiah, well, that was a bit of a problem, right? Overall, I think they were feeling very threatened. Consider the first question they asked. What were they trying to figure out in verse 7? So they wanted to know by what power or what name they had this authority. Where did this authority come from? Now, remember, this all started with the healing of a lame beggar outside the courts of the temple. Actually, a little bit later on in verse 22 of this passage, we find out that the guy, the lame beggar, was over 40 years old. We talked about this three weeks ago, about how the wording itself seems to suggest that he was brought there daily. Like he was, a, he was just like a, a normal fixture at that beautiful gate. Um, he'd be brought in by his family or friends and laid down at the gate where he would beg all day long. So people knew him. It's like it was a pretty big deal. Like they knew who this lame beggar was. And so when all of a sudden, so he'd been doing this for, for like 40 years, when all of a sudden he was walking and leaping and praising God, it would have been an amazing miracle and something that would have captured the attention of many people. And that that amazing miracle then led to the uh, authoritative proclamation of the gospel by Peter and then an overwhelming response of the people. And it got the, the attention of the Sanhedrin and they had these concerns. They wanted to know where was this authority from and, and what do you think of Peter's response to them? So we need to recognize that the response was not based upon Peter's excellent debating skills. It was the work of the Holy Spirit, and we see that clearly here. It's a direct fulfillment of what Jesus told them would happen when they would face persecution. They weren't going to have to rely upon their own wisdom. They weren't going to have to reply upon, rely upon their own ability to respond to the questions. God would give them the words, and that's exactly what we see happening here. So first, Peter brought up the fact that they had been arrested because they did a good deed for a crippled man. That kind of points out the ridiculousness of their arrest, doesn't it? He then addresses the, the question of the origin of power. It, he, he's pointing out that it didn't come from them, but specifically from Jesus Christ. Now, if you remember, we talked a few weeks ago about this story, and we talked about how he was healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Peter actually said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. So it was Christ's name, it was Christ's power, not theirs. And Peter pointed out that this Jesus, who this man was healed in the name of, was the same one that the religious leaders had rejected and killed. His explanation kind of came with an indictment on them. It was a bold answer. And not only did he mention Christ's death, but also the resurrection as well. Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose again in victory over sin and death. The Sanhedrin didn't have an answer, didn't have a response for that. And then Peter took it a step further by pointing out that Jesus is the cornerstone. What does that mean? Well, this is a reference to Psalm 118.22. Jesus quoted that psalm also in Luke 20. You can go back and look at that there. Um, and it's the, the, the psalm spoke of a stone being rejected. Now, in those days, when there was some kind of a building project, they would take a look at the stones, and if a particular stone did not fit correctly or was, um, uh, was not cut quite right, they would reject it. Um, and then they would use a different stone in its place. This was saying that the stone that the builders rejected was actually the cornerstone, the, the foundation stone, the stone by which all other stones should have been aligned. Peter then uses that to point to them rejecting Christ, that they had rejected him and he was the cornerstone. He was the one to whom all else should align. And then Peter shares this powerful, theologically important statement in verse 12, when he says, and there is salvation in no one else, 
For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So what is salvation? Well, the word itself in the original Greek means per preservation or, or deliverance. It can be used to speak of physical rescue or well-being. Um, but spiritually, it refers to the salvation from sin and death that is made possible through the work of Jesus Christ. It includes forgiveness of sins, a declaration of not guilty, redemption from slavery, a reconciliation to our Creator, adoption as sons and daughters, co-heirs with Christ, a new life that is made available to us in Him, and the hope of eternal glory that is available to all who believe in Jesus. And here Peter is stating that this salvation is found nowhere else, only in Christ. That would have been a very strong statement to the Sanhedrin. That was not the salvation story that they were teaching. And so it's easy to see why they were threatened by Peter and John and this gospel. Let's see the response, picking these up with verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition. But when they had commanded them to leave the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But in order that it may spread no further among the people, let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. So they called them and ch charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. What do you think of the Sanhedrin's response? First of all, notice that the, the Sanhedrin recognized that Peter and John were just uneducated common men. That doesn't mean they were calling them ignorant or illiterate. They were just saying that they were amateurs. They didn't have the, the education that qualified them to teach like the distinguished members of the Sanhedrin did. They had, these, the Sanhedrin had earned their authority. Remember our opening illustration. These were just a couple of uneducated guys in a room full of highly educated men. But because they didn't have that education, their boldness in handling of religious matters stood out to the Sanhedrin. It spoke volumes and caused the council to be astonished. Verse 14 suggests they were speechless. Why? Well, this suggests that the rulers were annoyed by what these guys were doing. But they really didn't know what to do about it because the beggar that they had healed was standing right there as proof of the power and authority that accompanied their message. And obviously the people had, had, had seen this. And, and so what could the, the Sanhedrin possibly say? I do find it interesting that while they acknowledged the miracle and, and saw it from a physical perspective that, that it had happened, they were not swayed by it spiritually at all. It's like they refuse to be impacted by the ramifications of what this meant in the name of Jesus Christ. But because they couldn't really argue against it, they decided to tell them to stop talking about it. What do you think of that? Seems kind of unfair, doesn't it? This was definitely a corrupt system. They didn't like what the guys had to say, but they couldn't really argue against it. They acknowledged the reality of the miracle and the power that was obvious, but they still tried to silence the message. Right from the beginning, as the gospel began to flourish, attempts were made to silence it. Let's see how Peter and John responded, picking things up with verse 19. Peter and John answered them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people, for all were praising God for what had happened. For the man of whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So what were Peter and John suggesting in verses 19 and 20? Well, basically, they were saying that, that God's authority trumped that of the religious leaders. No matter what those guys ruled, they needed to follow God. Remember, this was them living out the Great Commission. Uh, right before Jesus ascended to heaven, he called them to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world, and to go and make disciples. They were simply living that out. And God's call upon their lives, his commission for them to share the gospel, was a higher authority than following the rules of the world. I love the phrase, we cannot but speak, or we cannot not speak. 
It's like a double negative. They had to speak. They had to be witnesses. They had to share the gospel. They could not, would not be silenced. And notice in verse 21 that the rulers threatened them more. It was all they could do. There was too much goodwill from the people to, 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 for them to punish these guys. So they threatened them, warning them to stop and setting a precedent for the persecution that would come later. Now we could end there, but there's one more thing that I want us to see about the end of the story. Let's pick things up with verse 23. When they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So when they got back, they told the others what had happened, and together they brought it all to God in prayer. Now, I'm not going to dig into this too far. I, there's a lot here that we could go into, but I just want to simply ask this. What do you think of their prayer? So I love their prayer because basically their response in the face of the threat of persecution was to ask for more boldness. It's interesting because in verses 25 and 26, they quoted from Psalm 2, which in its original context focused on those who were rejecting the king of Israel. It spoke of how the efforts of those rejecting the king were doomed to fail. And then they make a connection to Jesus' death, recognizing that even in that terrible event, the Lord was still in control. And so with that in mind, they called on the Lord to look at the threats they had received. But rather than asking for God to help them have victory over those threats, they instead asked for boldness. In the original psalm, the psalmist goes on to speak of bursting their bonds and the Lord terrifying the nations with his fury and breaking them with a rod of iron. But they didn't ask for that in this prayer. Instead, they recognized God's sovereignty and trusted that he had this all under control, and they simply asked for more boldness. They prayed that they would stay faithful to their commission even in the face of opposition. Remember, that's exactly what stood out to the Sanhedrin in the first place their boldness. That word boldness actually shows up three times in these verses. It was what the Sanhedrin noticed about them, it was what they prayed for, and it was what God gave them. I think this is a pivotal moment in the book of Acts. Remember we talked about how the healing of the lame beggar was the first recorded healing after Jesus had ascended to heaven. It was the beginning of a new era, and at this point the perse persecution had not really begun. So far it was just threats and one night in jail. We know from the rest of the book that there was a whole lot worse to come. But at this point, it was still just a threat. The threat itself could have caused them to be more cautious and careful, but instead, they responded by asking God to help them be bold in the face of the threat. As we continue through the book of Acts, we see that's exactly what happens. They were bold. They shared the gospel no matter what, even when the threats turned into imprisonment and beatings and even death. Their prayers were answered. God helped them be bold. And in the face of terrible persecution, the gospel spread. Notice also God's immediate response to their prayer. He showed his power, and I also think he showed his pleasure by shaking the very place where they were. What a powerful, awesome moment that sets the stage for what's about to happen in the book of Acts. It's a great passage, right? Before I share my last thoughts, let me just ask you, what most stands out to you from this passage? For me, my favorite moment from this whole story comes in verse 13. I love that verse. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I love how it says that the Sanhedrin recognized that these guys had been with Jesus. Isn't that a great phrase, been with Jesus? What does it mean to have been with Jesus? Well, I think it means discipleship abiding in him, laying down your life to follow him, to know him, to be with him. It's exactly what Peter and John did. They gave up their lives to be with Jesus, and it showed. 
It wasn't about an education or a degree. It wasn't about pedigree or titles or standing or about being polished or perfect. It was about being with Jesus and the Sanhedrin saw it. What a testimony. That's what I want for my life. I want people to be able to see that I have been with Jesus. I want that to be what stands out. I want that to be what others see in me. Not some brilliant scholar or some polished preacher, but that I have been with Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I do pray that for myself and for all those listening. Lord, I pray that people would be able to see that in us, that we have been with you. And so, Lord, I pray that we would be with you, that you would help us to abide in you, help us to follow you, help us to be continually getting to know you and continually surrendering ourselves more and more to you and your work in our lives. May you have your way in us so that others can see that we have been with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.